This is episode 17 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. You've been in the classroom and you've taught college kids. <clears throat> Something I wasn't very good at. Uh, by the way, I think... Uh, how, do you, how do you know? Yeah, I think... You know. You know when you've written a good paragraph. Uh, you know when you've uh, delivered a good speech. And you know when you've... Uh, um, done something that you were not... It's not that we're unqualified. Um, it's just there are, you know, there are other things. Now, I mean, I will say the nicest thing, and it happens from time to time, uh, you know, is when people come up to you and say, you know, I was in your class and so forth, so on. And that's wonderful. And when I say I wasn't very good at it, I think I was out of sympathy with the evolving, maybe, nature of the classroom. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm. I don't expect to have thirty people who are as passionately interested in the subject as I am or I was, you know. Um, but I wasn't very good at adapting to a culture in which. Maybe a handful of those 30 people were there because they really wanted to be there. All right. <clears throat> Let's take somebody that really wanted to be there and um, they, want to, they want to do history. They want to become a historian. They want to become maybe a presidential historian. See, so, I, I'm but, the worst person to ask for <clears throat> advice. No, but no. What I'm asking you, though, is what would you t- how would you tell them to go about educating themselves about the yeah. subject matter and how did you do it what, what kind of techniques did you use over the years to, to fill your head you know, you, I was never conscious of, certainly technique is not uh, I mean excuse the expression no 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 but I mean I, I understand what you say yeah, but but it suggests um, a conscious pursuit but what did you do how did you absorb all this information you see the thing is to me it was just um an interest that was always there, and indeed didn't even I didn't even think of as, for example, a, a career in embryo. I mean, I I never, I literally gave no thought to um, what I'd be doing in ten years or twenty years or thirty years. I gave no thought to. Um, you know, first I write speeches, and then I run presidential libraries, and then I write books. I mean, I, you know, I don't. So I'm, I'm in some ways, the worst person to ask sort of career advice for. Um, I'm not even really <clears throat> asking about career advice as much as uh, are there a series of books, for instance, that, yeah. you know, that you've read that you say, you know, this, this stuff, this is valuable stuff. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, generally, yeah, um, look, it's, it's a cliche, but it, for, for universal reasons, if there's, if there's something, a subject that you're really interested in, I don't care what it is, say with me, presidents, uh, as a subset of a larger, int- but I mean, it was through them. I think probably that I that I broadened my interests. Uh, uh, obviously, presidents exist in a context, and that context is called history. So, um, and then as you connect the dots, you find yourself um, uh, throwing out a, a wider net. So your your intellectual interests and and um, hopefully fields of expertise evolve and grow. But equally important, become more nuanced and and sophisticated. Um, but that literally can grow out of a childhood, for lack of a better word, preoccupation. I mean, I read books about presidents at a at an obscenely early age. 
um, and enjoyed it. And, it. and it was as simple as that. It was, you know, I mean, I, I watching Omnibus. I mean, there, there, <laughs> there, there was something that I've never, I've never traced it to its origins. I don't know where the seed was planted. All I know is that pretty much from the first sort of conscious, you know, memories, um, I was interested in the larger world, um, in news, for lack of a, of a better word, for the, which I came to understand pretty quickly was history in the making. Do you have a favorite news source today? Well, I'm a PBS fan, um, and I'm an MSNBC viewer, which will give away my my political bias. Um, but people I, think you're a Republican conservative know, historian. But see, that that goes to the whole. In some ways, that actually is a is a very good, very fundamental explanation of why you should be wary of what people think. Or, or, I mean, you know, why you should be willing to rethink what you think you know. Um, historians are taught that as a rule, um, which is why we have revisionist history. And on, on balance, I'd say it's a good thing we do. It's, well, people don't remember Eisenhower, <clears throat> uh, Reagan, Lincoln, Dole. Um, oh sure. Well, they, yeah, they look at the Hoover, institutions, but see, that but you that, worked in, but, but, that, but that is, <clears throat> but that is, I would argue, I understand, but that's also partly a reflection of the um, media culture, which um, sort of short circuits thought, I mean, and, and assumes it takes for granted. If, if you're involved with these institutions, then ipso facto, you're a Republican or a particular kind of Republican or whatever. And then it's, it's, it's people loading onto you, people projecting onto you their assumptions, which, of course, is the absolute inverse of what historians and biographers, and indeed, I, I would imagine any kind of scholar does. Um, it's certainly, in a nutshell, the kind of approach I guess I've taken to the books I've written, for example, which is all about undoing, peeling away what we think we know about a historical figure. The Little Man on the Wedding Cake turns out to be a much more complex and interesting and I would argue admirable figure. And I argue maybe the best president we never had. What will when you finish your book on uh, Gerald Ford and when will that be out by the way? We're hoping 2020. <laughs> but when you finish that book, what do you think we will conclude about Gerald Ford's politics where he fits on the spectrum? You know, I hesitate to predict only because people are unpredictable. I do believe, I think people will be surprised that for much of his career in the House, Ford actually was something of an insurgent. He was not the kind of amiable party um, wheel horse, you know, that he was seen as once he became minority leader. Um, he was elected as an insurgent who took on uh, an isolationist, incumbent Republican, beat him in the primary with the support of organized labor. In his first term, he signed a petition for world government, world federalism. I mean, not the sort of thing you associate with good old Jerry, you know. And of course, and, and that's what, that's the best part of, for me. It isn't that I'm trying to prove an agenda. It is that I am pleasantly surprised and, you know, to find that the real Gerald Ford turns out to be, frankly, much more interesting, um, 
much less predictable um, figure than I think is generally believed, and even that I, to some degree, believe. And I thought I knew him pretty well. I, I, it's interesting. Um, a friend, good friend, who's reading the manuscript says his experience is every chapter he reads, he said, I thought I knew him well. And I didn't know him nearly as well as I thought. And that's been for me, in many ways, the overwhelming. I'm halfway through the manuscript. I've written 400 pages. And um, every chapter contains something. And it's not like I'm specifically you know, going after this or trying to manufacture. This is not a theme that I set out for. And, you know, uh, and who knows what happens the, the second half, but 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 certainly the notion of Ford as a surprising figure, who I would argue in his early days was in many ways that insurgent, and then in his and his as a post president with no more in effect political obligations, in some ways he reverted to that. Um, he he said once, he said, you know, I keep reading that I'm a plotter. Um, you know, that I, in effect, was just a party man. And, I, and that, I think, the whole business about physical clumsiness, I, I think he laughed that off. He said, having been a quarterback, I mean, having been in athletics and then a coach at Yale was actually very good preparation for dealing with the with the Monday morning quarterbacks of, of politics and to some degree history. That I don't think bothered him. I think what bothered him, I think he was concerned that he would he would be remembered as just, you know, a party hack. A a, a guy who just whose whose interest was no larger than or sympathies were no broader than. Um and the fact is, if you start thinking in his later years, you know, he and I think Mrs. Ford was a was a factor. You know, but you remember they were before you know before they died they were sort of marooned in the modern Republican Party. They were pro-choice. Um, you know, they were both more liberal than they had been, um, and I think some of that was in reaction to where they saw the the party going. Um, the the you know. I mean, any biographer, I don't care what the subject, I'm sure every biographer is in some ways delighted when he discovers that he was right. <laughs> it turns out in his choice of subject, because this is really more interesting, you know, more unpredictable, more whatever than, than he thought in the abstract. We have <clears throat> learned that you don't drive and never have dri driven? No. Oh, what's, God, no. What's the reason? I'd uh, <clears throat> be petrified, I suppose is the ultimate reason. Um, I would be dead within a week, and I no doubt would take innocent bystanders with me. It's a good thing I'm not on the road. I'd be. A, How do you a, get around then? God gave me two legs, and um, and I've managed to, you know, uh, or or uh, or uh, dragoon friends into, you know, and there's something called mass transit, which uh, works remarkably well most of the time. Um, I, I mean, one consequence is I've tended. Not always, by any means. I, I, I'm more of a city person. Um, but, you know, I've lived in 28 places. I've moved 28 times since college. And I lived in West Branch, Iowa, you know, 1,800 people, and Abilene, Kansas, which is not a whole lot bigger, and, um, and thrived. Where else? Well, the, the, the Simi Valley, California, was the Reagan, uh, Springfield, Illinois, was the Lincoln Library, um, uh, Lawrence, Kansas, was the Dole Institute, Grand Rapids, which is home now, but, you know, Boston for for many years, and I still sort of sentimentally have an attachment to, to Boston, um, the D.C. area. Um, I mean, I've, I've experienced, and I think in some ways, I've never really thought about it, but it, I think it has to be helpful 
if you're writing about politics and leadership over you know a long period of time, and I've really covered the gamut in terms of the range of American history, um, it helps to have lived in different regions to appreciate uh, different cultures and 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 if only to to understand a little bit better some of the factors that may influence i mean Gerald Ford was a quintessential midwesterner, and in some ways he took a he paid a price you know there are people who look on midwesterners well they they talk slow, so it's assumed they think slow um or they're square, you know, or somehow culturally deprived. Uh, I mean, the, Main Main Street is a brilliant satire, but it is a but it is a you know complete uh, exaggeration of the small, you know, airless, mindless uh, Midwestern burg. If you had twenty four hours to do anything. Go anywhere, do anything, see anything. What would you do? What would be your first choice? Oh, I know. Well, it would it would presuppose several impossibilities. But if you're saying you you can in fact do anything you want, um, anything, yeah, it would be um, to uh, have uh, dinner with the queen <laughs> and then bucky of Palace. or yeah, I mean. I mean I'm not picky. I'll go. I'll go to Windsor. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that would be uh, that would be my uh, uh, the, the, the top of my wish list. What would you ask her? See, my the problem with me is I'd take the historical approach. I'd ask her about her. I, I'd, I'd ask her about her grandmother, Queen Mary, whom she increasingly resembles. Um, I mean, I'd ask her about yeah. I'd ask her about uh, past members of, of the royal family. Um, I, 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 I got, I went to London for the, for the Golden Jubilee, um, the 50th anniversary, and had about a million people pressing me up against the, uh, the fence uh, at, at the palace. But it was, it was, an, it was what was required. I was going to. Stand there for several hours, pressed against the fence, to see uh, an up close uh, view of Her Majesty. Uh, following a concert that evening, uh, they came out into the into the courtyard, the four, the in front of the palace. I mean, she was probably she was a hundred feet away, and they got in a car and drove off to Windsor. So um, you know, I at least well, a million people were singing, you know, "God Save the Queen." Uh, that was a that was a better it was better than going to Times Square to see some ball drop you know on the on the old Times Tower. Um, that was a memorable experience. Um, I don't you know I'd like to have a visit with the Pope. <laughs> you see you see this recurring theme of of authority figures uh, inaccessible authority figures, but but at least you know. Not malevolent authority figures. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.